Yes. So I apologize in advance. I didn't quite squeeze in as much into this lecture as I should. Uh, but on the other hand, the formulas are somewhat overwhelming in this talk. So perhaps you'll have enough to chew on, even though I'm not going to get close to the proof of the Verisora conjecture in any particular case. Uh, I apologize. Um, but I'm going to uh, at least give you an indication of uh, how to get back and forth. If you recall, in the first lecture, we had on the one side a sort of sort of integrable systems picture, and on the other side, a kind of uh, representation theory picture. And I want to focus on how that goes in the general situation in this talk. So the first few slides are going to be a review of the last lecture. So we'll have a projective algebraic manifold over C called X, which has dimension R. And then we had this Novikov ring which was functions on the monoid inside the two homology of uh, X, uh, consisting of those homology classes that are represented by closed algebraic curves. And the product on the Novikov ring is the convolution product, not certainly not the pointwise product. Okay, so we chose a homogeneous basis with respect to the Dolbo cohomology um, or the, the, if you prefer, the rational, oh gosh, there's a, I'm sorry, I should put C here, not Q, because the Dolbo cohomology, we need C grading. Okay, I apologize about that. Um, then uh, I'm going to introduce the notation mu sub A will be uh, the shift of the um, holomorphic cohomology degree P A minus half the dimension. So it'll be centered at zero. Um, so the uh, top degree class, the uh, class of uh, degree R comma R will sit with mu A equal to R over two, while the identity has mu equal to uh, negative R over two. And uh, so you also see that in the um, the eigenvalues mu a are separated by one as you move up and down the left shed's decomposition. And we have our notation for the non-degenerate Poincaré form and its inverse. Okay, so that's the first, that's just the background. Now we have the large face space and this is going to be the formal space with coordinate ring given by these shifted uh, coordinates, uh, T, K, A tilde. So we're still going to form our generating functions with the, fun with the coordinates T, but the phase space itself, we think of as having only one formal point, which is at the dilaton shift. That's because that's the physical point in the, in terms of the, uh, well, as we'll see, in terms of the, the different uh, operators of the theory. So that's a subtlety which uh, one has to keep a close eye on. Then on the other hand, we have what's called the jet space, which is the space of all uh, infinity jets of maps from the affine line into our space with coordinates U, A. So these U, A, they're, if you like, it's the coordinates on the Dolbo cohomology itself. And then we have the derivatives. Um, the first u prime, that's the velocity of our path. Uh, u two, that's the acceleration and so on. All of these coordinates are vectors uh, indexed by uh, the index a, but I've left that out of the notation. And then as last time, we have a increasing filtration where we only consider those derivatives up to uh, the kth derivative. And recall that the topical, topological recursion relations of Iguchi and Chung, they imply that the nth derivatives of the potential Fg lie in the 3g minus 2 plus n uh, filtration of the uh, ring. So that gives you some idea 
of how bad these uh, potentials can get. And this statement is going to be one of the key statements in the whole talk. And it's what, if you like, separates arbitrary generating functions in the large face space from the sort of generating functions that we're actually going to consider. So in the paper of uh, Boriak, Postuma, uh, Fandler, and Chadrin, uh, this condition is called tame. And, um, and uh, the, the study of the tame generating functions is really, in some sense, the subject of the theory. OK, so recall also the total potential of the theory. And also recall this basic uh, endomorphism of the cohomology ring, which is just cut product with respect to the uh, first chain class. OK, so uh, now I can state the string equation. Uh, or recall the, the formula, it's, uh, there's a vector field, script L minus one, which is this vector field, which in terms of the shifted coordinates on the large phase space has homogeneous linear coordinates. But if you look back at the notes from the first and second lectures, you'll see that if you replace the coordinates, the shifted coordinates tilde T by the original coordinates T, then there's an extra sum in this formula, or oh, sorry, there's an extra term in this formula, which is minus the derivative with respect to the puncture direction. And then the string equation says that this vector field applied to Z plus this quadratic polynomial applied to Z multiplied by Z is zero. Now, the tildes on the T here in the quadratic polynomial are, are a red herring. That we can remove those tildes because, in fact, uh, t0 and t tilde 0 are equal, as you can see uh, in the second display here, because the only case where they're different is when k is 1. And the other thing to say is that this equation is really a statement about applying the vector field to the potential fg it says that it's equal to that quadratic form in the case of F0 and it's equal to zero in the higher genus cases. So along the flow lines of the string equation, the uh, potentials Fg vanish for G greater than zero. Um, so uh, as I mentioned last time, we can define a morphism from the large phase space to the jet space in which we take the coordinates ua just to these second derivatives of f0. We'll come back to this matrix a bit later. And then the higher derivatives, the k derivatives, are just given by taking k further derivatives in this special direction, the large phase space. OK? And then we see that the string equation implies that uh, this result, uh, that the the derivatives of ua are to first order the uh, shifted coordinates on the large phase space. And that shows that the, uh, this, this map is a, uh, a submersion at the daton point. OK? So, excuse me a second. <coughs> uh, so we want to study the relationship between the Virasoro conjecture in these two different coordinate systems. Uh, what we'll see is that the, just like the formulas for L minus one, that's an infinite sum. Now in algebra, infinite sums don't make sense. So this raises the question, what does this formula even mean? And what you'll see is that by going to the differential polynomials, we can rewrite these equations, the Virasoro conjecture, as finite sums. And so that puts them into a context where we can use algebraic geometric ideas. OK, now we come to Hori's equation, L0. So again, there's a vector field, L, uh, script L0, which um, is, again, has linear uh, 
it's uh, the vector field is homogeneous linear in the t tilde coordinates. And now you see that there are two different types of terms. There's one in which the uh, the index of our coordinate tk is left the same, and those terms are diagonal, but they come with an extra factor pr roughly proportional to k. And on the other hand, there's these extra terms which are only there in the case that the uh, anti-canonical, uh, the first term class of the variety x is non-zero. So on a Calabi Yao, the second group of terms are not present. And uh, note also that those terms shift k by one, just like in the string equation. On the other hand, we have some nil potence because, of course, uh, the cut product with the churn class raises degree, and so the matrix capital R is nil potent. So the the second group of terms is in some sense less important than the first. Okay, so that's our vector field. We'll come back to that vector field uh, in a moment. But now we add to that a quadratic form and a constant. And then Hori's equation says the L0 is dead, zero, which if you remember last time, it says effectively that, yes? Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So this L0 uh, involves, uh, the second term has R lower AB. So what do you want to find R A upper B? So, so are these the same or? Oh dear, uh, let's see. What? Uh, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction, sorry. Uh, where was the definition of R? There. So sorry, what was your question, R, that, that, I see a matrix R with A lower A, R lower A, upper B. Yeah. And, and here yeah. I've got the same matrix, same matrix. Oh, same matrix. Okay, 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 thanks. Okay. And uh, writing it in that complicated way is a bit silly. What I really meant to say was that R A B uh, uh, summed over gamma B is the churn, it's the churn class cupped with gamma A, all right? So I'm just taking churn class of X cupped with gamma A and decomposing it into a sum of combinations of gamma B. By the way, of course, this calculation is in the classical cohomology, so there's no dependence on the uh, Novikov ring. It just has, um, uh, uh, well, I, I stated, rational coefficients, but since I'm demanding a decomposition in the Dolberg cohomology, I guess complex coefficients. I'll send a corrected form of the lectures. Okay, so what this says effectively, uh, the Hori's equation, if you recall, is that if I apply L0 to F0, the zero genus potential, then I get that quadratic form, the second term, which is just proportional to R. Whereas if I apply L0, the vector field to F1, the genus one potential, I get this constant. And if I apply to FG for G greater than one, I get zero, okay? Um, notice before we move on, that there's a strange similarity between the quadratic form and the second group of terms in L0. And when you start working in a representation theoretic point of view, actually that quadratic form is merged into that sum it becomes part of the same part of the same sum in a way so in a similar way to the way in which for the string equation the quadratic form has the same coefficients namely the identity matrix as the coefficients of the um, vector fields so that's a little vague, but um, there's a bigger picture here. Okay, now we ah, now we have an exhausting task. We have to define the various constraints for n greater than zero. And these are a bit more complicated. The first thing to emphasize is instead of being first order differential operators, they're actually going to be second order differential operators. And on the other hand, they don't have a constant term or a quadratic form. 
So they have a different character from L minus one and L zero. So to define them, we have to form this rising product. We take a product of matrices with a generating parameter S. We take S times R plus X, S times R plus X plus one, S times R plus X plus N. So we that's a product of N. Uh, there's a problem. I apologize. What have I done wrong? Um, everything's gone wrong. Uh, yeah. So the sum on the left should be, that should be not K, but N. And also the statement should be N minus I plus, I'm sorry. So that's the first piece of I should have proofread these harder. How are we going? So what you can see is that if I said S equal to zero, this is just X times X plus one up to X plus N. If I set on the other hand, if I'm looking at the top degree, that'll just be R to the N plus one. Okay. And, and in between, we have some more complicated polynomials in X. So now we introduce, let's go to the bottom line and look at a, this vector field. I've left uh, the comma N out of the notation in EI, so you should substitute that back in. I'll send, as I said, the corrected, um, the corrected formulas. So we have these polynomials in R and K plus mu A plus a half. These, they're, it's a matrix for each I going from zero to N plus one. And, and now what you see is that, um, so in the maximum case, which is I equals N plus one, we have just R to the N plus one. And in that case, uh, where again, it's like in the string equation, raising the K index by one. The opposite extreme is we are in K equal, uh, I equals zero. And in that case, we're lowering the K index by N. And in that case, we just have a, um, the coefficient is a multiple of the identity. The power of R in that case is zero. So any questions about the bottom line of this page? It's quite a complicated formula. Okay, but you can see that it has some similar elements to L minus one and L zero. Now, the Virasora operator itself is this vector field plus H bar over two times the sum. And again, the sum is, has some common features with the terms that we just saw. The difference is that it uh, involves second derivatives, okay? So you see that for n equals one, there's exactly one collection of terms of this type, which involves second derivatives with respect to uh, the vector field in the direction t zero. Because when i is zero, and when n is one, and um, let's see, what have we got? When n is one and i is zero, then maybe I shouldn't attempt to explain. I should have written out explicitly the case L1, but uh, I leave that to you to attempt. Um, it's, it's kind of complicated. Okay. Any questions about these problems? Okay, so that's the Virasora conjecture. It says that in addition to the string equation and the Hori equation, we have ln then. And we need some commutation relation to hold between these, these operators in order that the conjecture is consistent. For example, if I apply 
the string operator L minus 1 to ln z, suppose that ln minus 1 of z is 0. Then ln commutator L minus 1 of z, uh, I've got a sign, the sign is wrong, I apologize. So the, there's a minus sign on the right hand side because L minus 1 of z is 0. That's the string equation. And therefore, the commutator is minus L minus 1 Ln of z. And on the other hand, we already know that Ln minus 1 of z is 0. And the difference between those two with the factor Ln plus 1, uh, that would better vanish um, if Ln z is going to vanish. And that's the role of those commutation relations. They say that these additional vanishing conditions are conditions which we already have because they come from the commutator relations. Okay? So uh, it turns out that the commutation relations are easy to prove except for the special case where n plus m is zero. And the proof is very similar to the case in the first lecture of a pure point. We introduce a vector of free fields, just as in the pure point case, except that now they're going to be shifted by some. Uh, so we have an additional power of z to the mu a in the, um, in the free field. And then we have this beautiful relation that uh, ln commutator the free field is equal to this, uh, uh, this differential operator acting on the free field. And then you see these differential operators satisfy our Virasoro commutation relations. And that shows that the commutation relations hold up to operators which commute the free fields. But by the uh, von, von Neumann uh, theorem, von Neumann file theorem, the only operator I think, you, I think Ezra, your voice is yeah? breaking down a bit. Sorry. I mean, your voice. How are we doing now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now is better. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now's better. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. The uh, the commutation relations are seen to hold up to a multiple of the identity, and so the only case that you could have a multiple of the identity in the commutator, you can see. Uh, just by trying to take the commutator by hand, that the only case is where n plus m is zero. So you have to show the, the extra commutation relation that L1 commutate L minus 1 is 2L0 and not 2L0 plus a constant. Okay? And as I said last time, that's proved, that was proved by Sheldon Katz using the formula of Liebgober and Wood, which uh, follows from the riemann roch hetzelbrock theorem, and uh, Katz uses it in the form which I've written here, where it, this is exactly the formula I had in the last lecture, except that there you'll see I already had P A minus R over 2, which is mu A. So this is a formula about uh, uh, what's called the supertrace of mu squared, where mu is the diagonal matrix whose entries are mu A. Am I uh, clearer now? I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Very good. Okay. All right. So now we begin today's lecture. Uh, that was sort of review, although last time I didn't get to the statement of the... And um, I'm going to be talking about um, how to do calculations with the... Um, uh, the um, inside this uh, ring of differential polynomials, this lambda mu. So remember, this is the ring generated by u and its formal derivatives. So it turns out that the most important object in studying all of this is this. Uh, so what this is, I've decided in today's talk not to mention Frobenius manifolds. So a Frobenius manifold is a manifold with a one-parameter family of uh, flat connections. Uh, and the, the connections depend 
uh, in a linear way on a parameter z. And these connections are connections on the tangent bundle of the manifold and they're torsion free. So that was a definition given by uh, Dubrovin. And somehow this ca uh, object, capital theta, is going to capture everything we need to know about the Frobenius manifold. Uh, the reason is that this is the fundamental solution of the family of connections. So at a given value of z, this gives us a, a, a matrix, depending on uh, where we are in the, the manifold, uh, whose coordinates are the functions ua, and, um, and it conjugates the flat connection with parameter z to the flat connection with parameter zero, the Levi-Civita connection of the flat metric. So uh, I should say the key point about capital theta, it involves second derivatives of F0. That means that it's in the zeroth filtration degree of lambda, of the ring lambda, lambda u. That means it doesn't depend on any of the derivatives of uh, u. It only depends on the functions u themselves. And for that reason, we can think of these this as a one parameter family of endomorphisms of the tangent bundle of a manifold with coordinates u. Now, what's the manifold with coordinates u? That's the formal completion of the uh, Dolboko homology at the uh, origin. So that's our Frobenius manifold. And we don't need to know anything about Frobenius manifolds except this particular uh, object. So now I come to the most important formula that's satisfied by this, which is this uh, fundamental formula due to Dubrovin, which says that theta, uh, so Givental would call this a symplectic uh, matrix. It's in the loop group. It depends on a parameter z. It's actually, um, it extends to the disk if you've studied loop groups. Um, it doesn't have any negative powers of z. And it has this twisted condition which Dubrovin, uh, which Givental calls symplectic. Um, but in any case, it's in one of the Katzmoody Lie groups. So how do you prove this formula? It, um, it's, uh, I, I think if you start trying to prove it uh, power by power, you'll see that it's very closely related to the topological recursion relation. The problem is that the topological recursion relation involves uh, the three-point functions. We have to take third derivatives of F0, whereas this formula only involves the second derivatives of F0. So how do we get from second derivatives to third derivatives? We have to take a derivative of this identity. So, so this is how the proof goes. On the one hand, if you apply the uh, puncture derivative, the derivative in the direction 0, 0, or t0, 0, 0, if you apply that to this equation, you, you can show using the topological recursion relation that you get 0. On the other hand, if you apply the string equation to this equation, you easily see that you get 0. In fact, you get identity minus identity, which is zero. Now, uh, we proved a lemma in the last, at the last page of the last lecture, which was that if a function on the large phase space is annihilated by the uh, puncture vector field, delta, and by the string vector field, L minus one, then it's a constant. So therefore, theta z times theta minus z adjoint is a constant. But at t equals zero, you can check that it equals the identity matrix. That's because the two point functions vanish at t equals zero. And therefore, theta is just uh, the Kronecker delta, it's the identity matrix. And so therefore, since we have a constant, which is the identity at the base point, uh, we're done. Okay, so that's Dubrovin's proof. And we're going to use Implicitly, I'm not going to give you many more proofs in today's lecture, but uh, this is somehow the main uh, in, 
result which makes everything uh, work in, in these calculations. Okay, so now we consider the coefficient of z in theta. If you look carefully at this matrix M, you'll see that it's just the same thing as the case k equals zero in capital theta. So it's the next term after the identity. So that's going to play a basic role also, and we're interested in its derivative, okay? So uh, if you evaluate this matrix uh, script X at the origin, you see that um, it equals the identity. So therefore it's invertible in a neighborhood of the ident of, of t equals zero, okay? So that's also going to be important. And when I say in a neighborhood, effectively, this is a Zariski neighborhood. So in other words, generically, this matrix is invertible. And so I'll invert it quite freely in my calculations. And again, the, the equation that I've given you here for theta inverse times the derivative of theta, uh, this is proved by the same technique as in our previous um, previous uh, equations. Actually, um, you can prove it directly by multiplying both sides by theta. It just occurs to me. If I move the theta over to the right-hand side, then I get exactly an instance of the topological recursion relation, okay? So, so now I want to show how to relate uh, vector fields in the large face space to vector fields in the um, jet space. So these vector fields in the jet space are going to involve, um, ah, I apologize, there's a, yeah, again, the, this last, the last line here is unreadable. So it's uh, just completely, it's missing a factor. So I'll have to tell you in a moment what that factor is because it's the whole point of the, the theorem. So the first line, we have a function. Those of you who may have looked at the work of Givental and people who, uh, who write about Givental's work will recognize that this function is the j function, the little j function on the large face space. So it's a, it's a formal function which involves in negative powers of z, uh, the shifted t coordinates, and in positive powers of z, it involves the first derivatives of F0. It involves just the one point correlators of the topological field theory. Um, so this is quite a, quite a mysterious object. Uh, I think in Givental's work, it's written very differently. He, instead of using z, uses the inverse of h bar in his formulas. So his formulas look quite different from this, but it's the same object. Um, now, if I multiply this vector of uh, uh, functions on the large face space by theta, which is this very simple function on the large face space, but depending on z, so we have on on the, uh, the left, we just have positive powers of z. And on the right, we have positive and negative powers of z. And then it turns out that the product has only negative powers of z. There are no longer, all the positive powers of z cancel out. Now, what is this? What are the coefficients? This is very confusing, I apologize. What's going on here is there should be at the end of this equation, the derivative with respect to, um, I'm sorry, I, ugh, let me, I scrag, sc forget everything that I just said. This formula is completely correct. Uh, I'm getting more and more confused. Okay, so remember I, I said that X was generically invertible. And so you see that when K is zero, we have that the leading coefficient of this weird product is Z inverse times X inverse. The next coefficient is uh, z to the minus two times 
x inverse times the derivative of x inverse, which is some complicated um, rational function of x. And then you see, finally, we just take the first column of that, where by first column, I mean that we take one of the indices to be um, zero. Actually, probably with my conventions, that should be a subscript zero, not a superscript zero. Um, but uh, let's don't worry too much about the details. Okay, is the hello? Hi. Yes, please. So, so I'm just a bit puzzled. So you you're saying that t that is some formal generating function, and then you're describe. Yes. Over here, some here, or... uh, hello, um, I wonder if there's another microphone. That microphone sounds really strange. It's a lot of uh, feedback and it's not very loud. Hi, so is this better? Uh, much better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, so is this, is this microphone better? I'm... Infinitely better. OK, all right, thank you. Yeah. So I guess the, yeah. Uh, yeah, in this TZ being a formal generating function, uh, and then you're describing yes. superscript A, right? Yes. So, so how are these assembled? Because in the next line, you're describing SZ. Yes. So it's going to be some sum over A's, is it, or? Yes. So I think, yeah, so what you're worried about is that this is some sort of infinite sum. And the thing is that because of the string equation, a lot of we can slash away at a lot of that infinite sum and replace it by zero. You see, somehow the string equation is already an infinite sum. And so effectively, what's going on is that the, the fact that this looks like an infinite sum, but it's really a finite sum. Actually, my perspective is that S of z makes more sense than t of z. That in some sense, we should think of t of z is whatever sense we can give to theta of z. Theta, yeah, I mean, if you move the theta to the left-hand side and multiply, multiply s by it, that defines t. And in fact, that defines the coordinates on the large phase space, in a sense. Okay, so they don't make so much sense. But what are the coordinates on the large phase space? They're going to be the times for the integrable system. So what's really going on here is that, um, that theta is the object which will, at least in, in genus zero, tell us how to construct the integrable system. Okay? okay? We'll see that in a couple of slides. So somehow, I haven't brought out the integrable system side of the story very much today because I just wanted to write down the Verisoro hierarchy. Uh, the, uh, you know, I thought that would take the whole lecture. Uh, um, but let's see how this goes. So, but as I said, the, you could view this instead as def explicit definition in terms of this rather concrete matrix X of the times of the uh, integrable system uh, in GFC. Okay. And we'll see something similar in a moment. Um, for now, we see a, uh, the opposite side of the story. Um, the first line here, tau of z, these are the derivatives that form the integral system. They commute with each other. And now, instead of multiplying by theta, we multiply by theta inverse, and we get uh, this generating function sigma. Now everything's OK. There are no negative uh, powers of z. So this side of the equation makes is much easier to interpret. And what you see is then that um, so sigma is obtained from these uh, the, the the flows of the integrable system by rotating them by theta. And remember, the role of theta was to rotate the flat connection of Dubrovin into the standard um, flat connection at z equals zero. So now let's calculate these vector fields explicitly. There's a, a completely explicit formula uh, which goes as follows. 
you see, we can write, um, oh shoot, misprint again, that, that boldface T should be tau. So we can write these vector fields d by dt, they commute with the, the vector field delta. Delta is delta zero, zero. I really wish I had a blackboard here. Um, so remember the basic vector field delta on uh, the ring of differential polynomials is delta in the direction t zero, zero. And uh, therefore uh, the vector field, uh, the, all, the whole generating function tau z, that's a, a vector field depending on z, and it commutes with delta. And vector fields of that type are called evolutionary vector fields, and they are entirely determined by their uh, dependence on uh, their derivative with respect, their value on u, on u. Because to calculate their value on derivatives of u, you just have to pass the derivative through the vector field. So tau of z, not t of z, but tau of z is given by this explicit formula. And um, so let's see. So now we multiply that by theta inverse to get sigma of z. And the key point is now that the um, factor that comes in front of d by the ul is seen to be in uh, the filtration degree. Uh, well, theta was in f0, so the derivative of theta is in fl plus 1. So you see that we have, uh, that this is ra sigma raises the filtration degree by 1. Never occurred to me to call it this, but you could maybe say that sigma exhibits some sort of Griffith's transversality. Now, the formulas for sigma are very complicated, but they're given completely explicitly by the matrix X and its derivatives. Okay, so just to get an indication, you see that sigma zero, the constant term in sigma, is given by this explicit formula. All right? So those are the basic vector fields. My goal now is to rewrite the Vera Soro uh, constraints in terms of these vector fields. All right? Now, um, the beautiful thing about these vector fields is that sigma L, if you look at the explicit formula for sigma L, you can see that it turns out to vanish. Um, on fk. Sigma L has no dependence on the kth derivatives of u uh, for k less than one. And in fact, it's if and only if fk is actually the subalgebra of functions which are killed by the vector field sigma L for L greater than k. And that's an extremely important uh, formulation of the topological recursion relation. So th that's actually the formulation of the topological recursion relation that I like the most. In some sense, that's exactly the way it's stated in the original paper of Iguchi and Chong, although this way of writing it is uh, a little bit reformulated by me. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the explicit formula for Verisoro in terms of the uh, vector field sigma k. So to do that, I'm going to need this matrix that acts on uh, the, um, the indices. And this matrix is just given by this explicit formula, but I'll interpret this formula in a moment. But for now, let's just write down that explicit matrix. Remember M was the linear term in theta. So M was the, um, the, the the second derivatives of F0 with respect to the, uh, the, the coordinates little t with k0. U is the diagonal matrix whose entries are the uh, p sub a. Well, minus a constant, but obviously a constant property of the f Actually, let's take a diagonal matrix, which uh, hi, uh, is inside. A... Perhaps here again. Hello? Uh, yeah, you no, couldn't sorry. hear me? Yeah, so I, I think. For oh, sorry, it's a question. 
No, no, so yeah? for a few seconds your voice was breaking down, so I think it's okay now. Oh, geez. Okay, let me go try again. Um, so we have, you, you heard my explanation of M, my re recalling what M was. Mu is the diagonal matrix whose entries are P sub A minus a constant, so that we can throw the constant away. So effectively, this is just the, um, the computator of the diagonal matrix whose entries are P sub A with M. And R is our matrix multiplication by the, um, the first churn class. And we form this uh, ordinary differential equation, this linear, uh, this connection with regular singularity on the line, uh, the line parameterized by Z. Now, I would like to mention something. Uh, uh, so the next slide, I'm going to talk about U and the basic idea is U is in some sense a quantization in the sense of quantum cohomology of the anti-canonical class of X. So uh, it turns out, so as you, uh, you can already see that as we go to T equals zero, U becomes R, the matrix R. So U is in some sense the Gromov-Witten deformation of the, um, the anti-canonical class. All right? So uh, in fact, I want to uh, remark that U is precisely multiplication in quantum cohomology by the Euler vector field that we introduced last time. The Euler vector field plays the role of the Hori vector field L0, at least as far as the coordinates UA are concerned. So it's given by this explicit formula, and it turns out it's a lengthy calculation that multiplication in the quantum cohomology by the Euler vector field is precisely the matrix U. So I just, in case you've forgotten, I'm assuming that you've seen this formula multiple times in the um, lectures this uh, last week. The quantum product is given by the, um, the third derivatives of F0 with respect to the uh, T0. Okay? So, um, and the key point, of course, is that it's an associative product. That's the witten graph valinda valinda formula. It's commutative, clearly. And at t equals zero, it's just the cut product. So most results that are known about the Virasoro conjecture concern uh, projective manifolds with semi-simple quantum cohomology. And uh, this is the situation where the matrix U is semi-simple and has distinct eigenvalues, at least on an open, non-empty subset of our jet space. So that condition is frequently satisfied. Uh, it's satisfied for toric varieties. Satisfied, I've just been looking at a longer list of uh, projective manifolds for which it's satisfied. I didn't uh, know all of these cases. I've learned that it's also satisfied for a large class of Fano threefolds. It's also satisfied for blow-ups of those at uh, sets of points. And in particular, the simplest case and the first that was noted, it's uh, the cohomology of co quantum cohomology of projective spaces is semi-simple. So as you know, if you take CPM, its uh, cohomology is generated by the the class in degree two, uh, the, let's say, the um, uh, polarization, whose m plus first power is zero. So that's the unique relation. And in quantum cohomology, that deforms to x to the m plus one equals q. And q, of course, is the, um, well, it's actually q times one, I should really say, where one is the identity element. And Q is the generator of the Novikov ring. Of course, in the case of projective space, the Novikov ring is just a power series ring generated by Q. Okay, so I'm uh, not going to say so much about how, uh, the proofs of the Virasoro conjecture, except to say that they rely. Sorry. Ezra, can yeah. Can I ask you one question? Uh, so yes, this, please. Uh, last discussion, just to be clear, you said Virasoro conjecture is known in certain cases. You 
Yes. Astro conjecture for genus zero, right? So, so all this discussion is for genus zero. So the Vestro conjecture in genus zero, as you'll see in a moment. Well, so the problem is that it, there are many Verisora conjectures in genus zero. As I mentioned last time, uh, you see, if you look at, um, let's see. Oh, where are we? And the first page. Yeah, if you look at mu A, I, I defined it as P A minus R over two. Now, the way it enters into Hori's equation is through the dimension formula. But the dimension formula will also hold if instead of PA, we have QA or any affine combination of PA and QA. For example, PA plus QA over two, half of the degree. And each of those gives you a, um, a, a, virus, a potential Virasoro conjecture but only the ones with PA or QA can possibly be true, all right? Because already at the L0 stage, the constant term would be um, wrong in the commutation formula between L1 and L minus one. So uh, we don't even know how to formulate in short the Verisoro conjecture in such a way that it has a chance of being true unless we're on a compact Kähler manifold. That's number one. So on the other hand, any of those conjectures in genus zero that I just mentioned is true uh, for sort of soft reasons. And I'm going to show you, uh, in fact, basically the reason, so I gave a proof of the Verisoro conjecture in genus uh, zero, and essentially the reason it's true is precisely this theorem. So it's the, the, the fact that the there are no terms of positive powers of Z in the right hand side. And that allows you to, to you can just, you write the, um, the Verisoro conjecture as a residue of something. And then you just see that the thing it's a residue of has no term of power Z minus one. It's, it's uh, completely, uh, it's C to vanish. Okay. Now, uh, why am I getting so much interference? Maybe it's that bad microphone. Could somebody switch the bad microphone off? Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yeah. So that, yes. That's a, if you switch the bad microphone off, right. I can hear, I don't hear a really loud feedback. Okay. Is this better? That good microphone isn't causing me any problems, but oh. the, mad, the bad microphone is causing a constant hum. Okay. And also it's almost inaudible when people try to use it. I'm sorry. Okay, okay good. So um, uh, I didn't answer your question completely because uh, there's uh, one, somehow the higher the dimension, the more trivial the Verisor conjecture comes. So for Calabi-Yau manifolds of dimension three and higher, uh, much of the grubov witten invariants are zero. And the Verisor conjecture is essentially only non-trivial in genus zero. And so the case of K3 surfaces is kind of a transitional case. And uh, there's a bizarre way to prove it which is to show that the grubov of witten invariants also vanish. The way you do that is by deforming to a non-algebraic K3, and then you know that non-algebraic K3s don't have any algebraic curves. And so the, the um, moduli stacks are empty. So I don't know. That's, uh, I think I've probably partially answered your question. So, um, so now, as I mentioned last time, the basic idea of Giventhal was he introduces a group action, and I'd hoped to, to show you the group action today, but I ran out of uh, time to write down the slides. So that'll have to be next year. And the basic idea is 
so the operators in Givental's group are in some ways quite similar to the Verisoro operators in form. They involve quadratic forms, line, vector fields with linear uh, coefficients and second order differential operators with constant coefficients. And in fact, they lie in some sort of metaplectic representation. There, there is some sort of representation of our given tile loop group on uh, vertex operators. And so he writes down some explicit uh, element of the given tile group and acts on the tau function of the KDV hierarchy, satisfying the string equation that we saw last time. And in that way, he gets a solution of some Verisoro equation, uh, Verisoro constraints. And his task is to identify the new Verisoro constraints with the Verisoro constraints of the Verisoro conjecture. And he does that by careful, careful uh, calculation of um, asymptotic expansions. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very intricate um, calculation with special functions, but he's able to do that. Okay. The best reference for Givental's proof is the paper in Annals of uh, Coates and Givental. Now, I'm going to now show you a way of rewriting the uh, Verisoro constraints in such a way that they're just given by finite sums in each genus. So that will somehow regularize the formulas in such a way that they, they make sense because the otherwise there's really no way to write them as finite sums. All right. So basically uh, the formula I've written here is uh, completely straightforward to establish given the formulas I've given you for S and Sigma in terms of T and tau. You basically, you just insert the formulas. Uh, what you see is you get Instead of sigma, you put theta inverse tau. Instead of s, you put theta adjoint of uh, t. You bring the theta adjoint over to the right-hand side, and then you see that we're just conjugating the connection delta z by theta, and you have to calculate what that is. And it turns out to be this uh, essentially uh, very simple object, which involves just uh, the matrix capital R and the matrix mu. And that's, that's just how the formula follows. But uh, although in many ways, this formula for the vector field is much more complicated, it has the great advantage that if we're acting on a function in one of the finite filtration degrees of uh, our ring of polynomials, then only a finite number of terms are non-zero because only a finite number of the sigma sub k uh, non-zero in any given filtration degree. So, so using this formula, we can now prove the Verisoro conjecture in genus zero. Precisely, you, it turns out that uh, you essentially prove it by induction on N. So if you want to know the details, you can look in my, my old paper from 98 but um, it's, it's really quite straightforward. And this is uh, actually very similar to a proof that was given by Givental. The reason is that, that, so he's thinking in a more geometric way and his geometric statements very closely correspond. There's a dictionary between his geometric conditions and the algebraic formulas that I'm writing down here. So the point is that the, the Verisoro conjecture in genus zero has a somewhat special nature because it involves uh, the negative powers of Planck's constant. But once we know that it holds in genus zero, it makes it easier to write out the formulas in a uh, higher genus. So what we're going to do is apply the Verisoro constraint ln to z and multiply by z inverse to get rid of unnecessary complication. The result is a Laurent series in Planck's constant, uh, which is, uh, I, I denote the terms little z n g, where g is the genus. 
And uh, it, uh, what we've seen is that for n greater than zero, Zn comma zero is zero. So now we'll turn to the formula. So I'm going to now give you form explicit formulas for Zng uh, in terms of our uh, coordinates. So, so the first formula here, the formula for Zn1 in genus one, it's given by this explicit vector field, which we had on the previous page. And remember, F1, does anybody remember which uh, filtration degree F1 is in? Question to the audience. Okay, does anybody remember which filtration degree Fg is in? G minus 2 minus n or something? 3G minus 2? Okay. So Fg is in filtration degree 3G minus 2. And so F1 is actually in filtration degree uh, F1. So it involves only the coordinates and their derivatives. And that means that Ln here, the only pieces that are going to enter are the sigma sub zero and the sigma sub one. So it's a vector field in just the, if you like, tangent bundle of the, of the Frobenius manifold, the first jet space. So it's just a very low finite dimensional algebraic variety. And so this Ln is some explicit vector field in the, that finite number of coordinates and then we have this rather complicated um, uh, function, which is the error term. And I'll just remark that if you set n equal to zero, then this is exactly the constant term in uh, Liebgobber and Wood in Sheldon Katz's calculation. So this is a generalization due to Liu of the calculation of Katz using Liebgobber and Wood. And and for that matter, for n equals negative one, we know the string equation says that L minus one, the vector field L minus one applied to F one is zero. And indeed that sum is zero for this, for n equals minus one. So, so this formula is actually true for all n greater than or equal to minus one. Okay. So this is, um, this is uh, a little bit complicated. This is sort of breaking off. Hello? Hello? Hi, Ezra, can you hear us? Hello? Yeah, so... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Now I can't really know. It's not... Hello. Uh, yes. I, I can't hear you again. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah, we shall we? Shall we? Yes. Shall we call again? Let's call again. Do you think that's a good solution? Uh, now we can. Or not worth it. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so now it's going well. Okay, good. Just okay. Uh, maybe oh. you can repeat the previous slide, just uh, briefly. Yeah, the last part. Yeah. The whole slide, or just yeah, the last? Just part? the last part. The last part. Yeah. So, yeah. So the point I wanted to make was that. Uh, this formula is also true for n equals zero and n equals minus one. For n equals zero, that constant, uh, that uh, the constant, the function is exactly the constant term in um, Sheldon Katz's calculation, the one that is calculated by Liebgobber and Wood. And for n equals minus one, it vanishes. So, so we recapture the string and uh, and Hori's equation. Okay. So in the semi-simple case, uh, this was proved to vanish by Dubrovin and Zhang. And their proof was a little surprising. They took the relation I found on gromov witten invariance in genus one and rewrote it on the Frobenius manifold in uh, a coordinate system. So there's a coordinate system that was introduced by, by uh, Dubrovin 
in the semi-simple case, it's the coordinate system is the eigenvalues of u. So it turns out the matrix u, um, or if you prefer, its characteristic polynomial is in fact a coordinate system on the Frobenius manifold. And if you rewrite the um, the uh, by relation for gromov whitney invariants in genus one, in this coordinate system, it turns out that it precisely gives the vanishing of this formula. So it's a slightly bizarre situation, um, but that that was a, a somehow a, a very attractive uh, piece of evidence for the Verisora conjecture. So they proved the Verisora conjecture in genus one uh, in the special case of um, uh, yeah, so I'm leaving out the main step in their proof, which is that um, F1 uh, can be written as a function uh, just in the zeroth filtration degree plus some explicit formula, uh, which is the, um, the logarithm of the determinant of X. So, so in that sense, it turns out that the dependence of F1 on derivatives of the coordinates is is somewhat in a, of an illusion, and using that you can uh, simplify the the for, this formula considerably. But uh, I'm not going to go in that direction. Okay, so so here's the explicit formula uh, for the uh, Verisora conjecture when written out on the in terms of the differential polynomials for the uh, potential Fg. So Fg, remember, involves 3G minus 2 derivatives. So the vector field Ln of Fg, that's a vector field in some 3G minus 2 jet space. So it has a dimension which is equal to 3G minus 2, sorry, 3G minus 1 times the dimension. Now, the next term involves also some complicated. the first you now have again a complicated coefficient, and now you're going to apply again another derivative. So there are quite a lot of terms in the second term, but it only involves Fg minus one. And then finally, we have a quadratic term involving Fh and Fg minus H where h goes from one up to g minus one. So this is a, a type of formula which is a loss. What physicists think of is that the, the last term is a term five diagrams with two vertices and it's connecting them. The middle term is a Feynman diagram for one vertex. Um, it's a loop joining it to itself and the first term is some stuff. And another way of saying it is that these um, correspond to the, you could say that they correspond to the divisors in mg bar, but I'm not sure if that's a useful point of view. Okay, now I just want to tell you as uh, at the end of my talk, the the uh, nicest application for this is that it gives a very direct proof of a basic theorem of Dubrovin and Zhang. And so I'm just going to close my lecture with that theorem. So suppose that X has semi-simple homology. So remember I gave two different definitions. One was that for a generic value of the parameters T, the quantum product is a semi-simple cohomology ring. Um, the other possible definition is the uh, generic jet space, the coordinates of the eigenvalues of the matrix B are distinct. Yeah, yeah are distinct. But the derivative of U is generically zero. Okay? I'm sorry, is generically non zero. Yeah. And sorry? Yeah, could you repeat the last uh, couple of sentences? I yes. Sorry, the last couple of sentences. Yeah. Yes, there are two possible definitions of semi-simplicity. One is that for a generic value of t, 
the quantum product is a semi-simple cohomology ring. Semi-simple and commutative. So in other words, that it splits over C into a sum of idempotent rings, just rings where E squared is E. The other possible definition is that the uh, eigenvalues of the matrix U give coordinates on the, uh, the cohomology space, the Frobenius manifold, at least generically, or another way of saying it, the discriminant of U, uh, the endomorphism U, is uh, not zero. Okay? So uh, suppose we have that condition. For example, suppose X is a, a toric variety or a, uh, what else, from Del Pezzo surface or various examples. So then, if, uh, suppose F lies in filtration degree K in our ring of differential polynomials, and suppose that it's constant along all of the vector fields associated to the Virasoro conjecture, then it's automatic that F is uh, in filtration degree K minus one. So what we do is, Using the explicit formula for the vector fields, using this explicit formula, we can strip away for solutions of the uh, for solutions of these linearized constraints. We can show that actually by induction, then you see that f has to be a constant if it satisfies those equations. So that's quite remarkable. By the number of equations is independent of the cohomology ring, just assumes that it's semi-simple. And somehow just one sequence of relations is sufficient to show that uh, a solution of this family of uh, constraints is automatically a constant. And uh, so because of that, what we see is uh, that if the quantum cohomology is uh, semi-simple, then any solution of the Virasoro conjecture must be unique. Okay, and the way you do that is you take these equations and you do that. Okay? I hope that that is somehow, that I think you can probably, using this lemma, the lemma is this, probably the longest pair of, the longest proof of any in this talk, but uh, apart from the Verso conjecture itself, uh, but if you know this lemma, then you should be able to use this formula in order to show that the solution is the circuit which is quite a beautiful theorem. Uh, and when I said it's unique, it's unique up to a constant factor, because if I multiply Z, by a constant, a non-vanishing constant, then of course I still have a solution of the Verasoro conjecture. But what does multiplication of z by a constant mean? When we take a logarithm, that means that we're shifting s by a multiple of Planck's constant, a constant multiple of Planck's constant. In other words, we're shifting f1, the genus one potential, by a constant. Now the genus one potential, uh, a constant in the genus one potential, and this constant is in the Novicom ring, but uh, it's not necessarily just a rational number, it may be any element of the Novicom ring. These numbers are the gromov witten invariants for stable maps from genus one curves to X with no marked points, okay? So uh, that constant cannot be determined by the zero conjecture. But apart from that, the Verasoro conjecture, if it holds, completely determines the potential. Um, so somehow, if you look at what I've used, I've used semi-simplicity, and I've also used this infinite sequence of differential equations on the potential, which are the topological recursion relations. Uh, if I go back to the beginning, the key points I made at the start of the talk, the bottom line here. This condition is the condition which has made everything that I've talked about in today's lecture 
uh, work. And under this condition, you see why we can replace all of the infinite sums in the naive way of writing the Verso conjecture by just finite sums, and thus yeah, we can approach them by analysis. Okay, so that's we can't. Uh, hi, Ezra. Hello. I think we cannot hear you anymore again. That's it. Through the last uh, minute or so. So could you just uh, repeat the last? Oh, I didn't even hear what you said just now. You didn't hear what? Oh, yeah, no. So the last, I, uh, maybe the last, yeah, couple of minutes. What you said, we couldn't hear you totally. So. Oh no! I'm sorry. Okay. What was I saying? Uh, so I was talking about this theorem. Did I, did I succeed in explaining how the lemma? implies that the solution of the Verisora conjecture is unique. Yes, yeah, so up to a constant which when you take off. Up to a constant in the Novikov ring. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. A, an invertible element of the Novikov ring. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, and the Verisora conjecture can't, can't give you any information about that constant. Uh, on the other hand, that constant can be calculated by the divisor equation. So if you go back to the last lecture, you'll see the divisor equation gives you an what you do is you add another point to the genus one curve, so it becomes an elliptic curve, it's a generic it's an elliptic curve. Now we see there's a relationship, and now at that point you put an arbitrary uh, cohomology class of degree two, and in that way you can evaluate the element of the Novikov ring on H2, the cohomology H2, and in that way get complete formula. So, so actually, this additional equation, the divisor equation that I haven't said so much about, is strong enough to determine the constant. But the Verisora conjecture alone is not. Okay? So, I just wanted to say that somehow uh, it's quite surprising that the Verisora constraints are enough to completely determine the potential. But the reason is because we have this uh, tameness property that the um, the that FG lies in this finitely generated part of our uh, ring, and that those uh, that additional information allows you to do downward induction. Uh, it somehow reduces what might have been some mysterious representation theory with. Um, weak ordering and goodness knows what other complicated uh, features, it reduces it to calculations which are much more like algebraic geometry. Okay? So, um, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. Did you hear the last two minutes this time? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, no, yes, we did hear you the last. Uh, oh, yeah, good. The last okay. Okay. Sorry about the technical problems. Yeah. Yeah. So are there any questions? Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Yep. Yes. Yep. So uh, you said that uh, when the quantum cohomology ring is semi simple and, and these other conditions are satisfied, then the various or conjectures mm. uh, uniquely mm. determine. Uh, the row of Witten invariance, right? Yes. So, uh, is there an algorithm to actually determine all the uh, invariance from the first few, like in the case of uh, Witten's conjecture? Well, the answer is yes. Um, so, the problem is, and so the best place to see that in action, it's not actually a projective manifold, but rather uh, it's something called the spin R model. So, so it turns out that there's a generalization of the Gelfandiki polynomials. Um, if you, you think all the way back to the first lecture, I had the operator uh, delta squared plus uh, U. Okay? 
and you can uh, that's a second order differential uh, operator ordinary differential operator with uh, co uh, linear coefficient with a linear uh, operator you can replace it by an operator of degree um, r okay so you could have a cubic a third degree ordinary differential equation a fourth degree and so on and somehow the fact that we just have one function u is related to the statement that SL2 has rank one. And as you go to higher higher order differential operators, you get uh, integral systems associated to SLR. Now Witten, yeah, Witten again, um, conjectured a relationship between uh, a more sophisticated uh, analog of the Konsevich moduli spaces and uh, these equal systems. And this theorem was proved by uh, Barbara Chadrin Monkin. So that's an excellent paper to refer to. So that uses the given tile group. It uses that the given tile group preserves topological field theories. That's uh, proved by an explicit calculation. And that's somehow the main extra ingredient that I have neglected to tell you about. Now, then Zvonkin took the case R equals three and explicitly applied Gibbenthal's algorithm to calculate the uh, higher inference. Actually, what he did was he explicitly he used Gibbenthal's algorithm to explicitly calculate in terms of something hypergeometric function, he was able to calculate the element of the given tile. So I guess once you've got the element of the given tile, the principle of the you can now, you have an explicit group elements, you have an explicit vector, the KDV tau function. And so applying this given tile group element, you go from the KDV tau function to this W algebra tau function. Remarkable calculation that Zvonkin was able to perform. And he didn't just do it for fun. He did it because once he'd done that calculation, he obtained Pixton's relations. So, so this is the most remarkable thing. There's a conjecture that all relations between tautological classes on the Devine mumford moduli spaces are given by Pixton's relations. And it's very curious because if that conjecture is true, and there's a lot of evidence that it is, then Faber's conjecture is false and vice versa. So the situation is quite up in the air at the moment. Um, the problem occurs around genus 26. The two conjectures diverge. So that's the, that case uh, is one case where there are explicit calculations and you can find more examples of this in um, also in lecture notes by uh, uh, to rob it with the word uh, pan levé in the title. So those lecture notes of to rob it are very helpful. Yeah? What's the word? Pan levé. So, you know, I, have you ever come across pan levé transcendence? So these are non-linear non analogs of the hypergeometric equation. And they were classified by Pelevé, although I believe he missed some. Anyway, these uh, transcendents, they, they arise quite naturally in certain uh, uh, problems in algebraic geometry. And anyway, the Pelevé, um, so the Robin has some lecture notes in which he, he does explicit calculations, uh, more at genus zero than his calculations. So he does explicit calculations relating the genus zero, if you like, invariance of the W hierarchies of the Gelfandiki hierarchies to the KDV case. Okay, thanks. And then in some sense, what given time does is quantize those. Okay. Okay, so are there other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Ezra for agreeing to give these talks. That was a nice set of lectures. Thank you.